In this series on discipleship, I told you last week, we're going to get very specific and very practical about how to implement some evangelistic techniques in your own life. Evangelism is the act of actually bringing the gospel message to other people. And so we're going to be very practical on that issue today. But as we get going, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles with you, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And uh, we'll get rolling. In nearly 20 years of youth ministry, uh, we moved a lot of teens to and from a myriad of events over the years. And while traveling, I don't think I ever lost a teenager. Could be wrong about that. Maybe there's some 30-year-old somewhere in a bathroom going, where did they go? But I think I got them all. Now, moving teenagers is actually a rather complicated engagement. You've always got stragglers. You've got those who are easily distracted. And quite frankly, you've got those who are straight up oblivious. We typically sent sponsors into bathrooms to make final calls, and we would call roll, and we would load up. Or sometimes if we were traveling on a bus, we would get everyone onto the bus, and then we would call roll. Now, I realized early on in youth ministry that you can't expect teenagers to say here or present. It just doesn't seem to work that way. So instead, we just kind of gave in right away, and we said, when you hear your name, go ahead and make a loud noise or say something or gesture wildly to a certain that you are, in fact, here. And so when it came to calling roll, you get all sorts of responses, mostly contingent on how the individual felt regarding attention. I don't know if you've noticed this, but some teenagers like attention. Some teenagers do not. So some of the more bashful students would prefer to blend in. They'd call their name, and they'd give the minimalist response to be marked present. Here, present, right? Then there were others. Others who would loudly exclaim an inside joke, or maybe they would try to trot out a movie quote as fast as they could, or just make an obnoxious noise. Teenagers are excellent at making obnoxious noises. And in some rather impressive instances, attempting to pass gas with sufficient volume so, so as to be heard. Uh, I don't think I have to tell you those were not the girls. <laughs> now, what happened on the small scale on those youth retreats is happening on a very large scale each and every day in offices, in schools, in factories, in warehouses, and the like. Now, hopefully without the controlled flatulence. But people are trying to be heard. People are trying to be seen on one level or another, whether for minimal attention or whether loudly uh, we're all quietly or loudly declaring our presence where we are. So how are you known at work? How do people see you? How are you known in your family circles? In what way do you announce who you are amongst those people groups? What would other people say about you? Were I to trod this out, this question out in front of your peers or your coworkers, and I said, tell me about this person, who are they? What would they tell me? This is actually a first step to practical evangelism. You have to show up, you have to be seen, and you have to be seen for who you actually are. This week, we're going to be examining Jesus' words regarding salt and light. We're going to be challenging you to implement some of these things and principles, these principles we're going to talk about, we're going to challenge you to implement these in your sphere of influences during the course of this week and going forward throughout your life. Before we begin, though, let's pray. Our God, we come before you as those greatly desiring to follow you in this life. And Father, I pray that you would make us aware uh, of maybe some shortcomings we have in this regard, but Father, mostly I pray that wherever we find ourselves, that from this point forward, we would begin doing a work that honors you and glorifies you with our lives. Father, we're going to dip in your word today. We're going to ask that you bring us insight, that you make those words stick in such a way as to change us. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus, and all of God's people said, amen. So today we're going to start by looking at who you are. Secondarily, we're going to talk about salt principle, and, or the salt principle. And thirdly, we're going to talk about the light in city on a hill principle. Let's begin by talking about who you are. When it comes to cartoons, there are some really weird protagonists out there. And sometimes I'll hear from parents that they feel like modern cartoons are really weird. For instance, a uh, cartoon about a sea sponge with strange geometry who works as a fry cook. That's a little strange. That sounds like somebody's acid trip got trotted out and, and, made, into, and made into a narrative, right? But cartoons have really always been strange. Maybe you're older and you remember the cartoon Popeye. Any of you remember Popeye? 
Have you ever looked at Popeye? I mean, really looked at Popeye. Popeye is a sailor man. Man? His face is a mash of lumps with a pipe sticking out of it. And most of his cartoons actually revolve around a, a saving his love interest from an aggressive predator named Bluto. That's every week. That happens. And how, of course, does he save them? Got to eat your, eat your spinach. So here's, here's the lesson that you learn from Popeye. Beware of lumpy-faced strangers with deformities in their forearms because they could eat cold vegetables out of a can and then destroy you. Popeye was a man of few words, but he had a number of cool taglines. And I don't know if you remember this one. I am who I am. That's all that I am. I am who I am. That's all that... Now, if you're biblically literate, you're like, wait a minute. That sounds like something I read in Exodus. Yeah, it is. When God is asked for his name, he says, I am, or I am that I am. So it sounds nearly biblical, but beyond just like the historical biblical aspects of this, Popeye's doing something interesting here. He's stating that to observe him is to know him and understand him. He is who he is. And so this is what I turn back on you as we get going this week. Last week, I ended our sermon, and some of you caught it. I said this about Jesus. I said, notice that Jesus, wherever he shows up, is who he is. That he presents himself, that he is the same person in every environment and circumstance. And by being that person, the gospel of Jesus Christ goes forth. He was declaring his presence. He was declaring his commitments. He was declaring his nature by just being himself where he was. The rabbi is who he is. What is a disciple? A student. A disciple is a student of a master or a rabbi, right? And so if we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, that means we are students. We are the yeshiva. We are those who sit at the feet of the master, of the rabbi Jesus. And so part of what we want to look at is who exactly was Jesus? If I'm meant to emulate his life, what was he like? A couple things I want to note at the outset. First of all, Jesus was a person of interest. And by that, I mean this. When you encountered him, you knew that you encountered him. He was deep. He was insightful. He asked hard questions. He told stories that sometimes amplified a powerful truth, but almost always confused people and were challenging. He wasn't necessarily wordy, but when he spoke, he delivered words in such a way as that you couldn't forget them. Jesus was a person of interest. Jesus was a person of integrity. This rabbi's life was consistent with what he taught. Everyone say hypocrite. Okay, a hypocrite was an actor or a play actor. You guys remember me talking to you about this. It was somebody who put on a mask. And the way we use the term hypocrite right now was first, as near as we can tell, was first used in the way we use it by Jesus of Nazareth as he talked about people who were putting on faces and faking who they were. Jesus did not live that way. Jesus did not tell people to live in a certain way and then live in a different way, like the Pharisees who were present in his day. Rather, Jesus spoke words of direction, and then you could see it in his life. You could see it in the way he lived. He was a person of interest. He was a person of integrity. He was a person of authority. Jesus spoke with confidence and assurance that people found to be exotic, and enticing, and often very offensive. He knew what he knew, and he said things and made claims that most humans would have difficulty with. He was a person of authority. Jesus was an open invitation to community. Have you noticed this? Have you noticed when Jesus left a whole lot of the conversations he was in, that he left it with a, come and see, or come, follow me. It's an invitation to become part of a community. This is who Jesus was in every circumstance. Who are you? Are you those things? Are you a person of interest, a person of integrity, a person of authority? Are you an open invitation to community? What if I told you that next week, our elders were going to require that you deliver the sermon? Comfortable with that? Most people are terrified by the prospect of public speaking. But let's make it more interesting. The elders have said they need you to deliver the sermon, but they want you to do it in a tiny sailor suit. And you might be thinking, well, that would be terribly embarrassing. I'm not sure I want to do that. Oh, yes. 
But beyond the sailor suit, we're also going to need you to juggle. You might be thinking, I don't know how to juggle. Or even if I do know how to juggle, I don't think I can juggle throughout an entire sermon. Oh, and by the way, also, while you're doing this, we've invited a whole lot of people who are brand new to Christianity. And they've decided that based on, they've never been, they're not Christians, they're not following Jesus, but based on what you say, they're willing to either commit their lives to Jesus Christ or they're going to forego the whole thing and forever abandon Jesus. How many of you would tell me, yep, I'll do it? Probably nobody. And quite honestly, the vast majority of, would, of us would look at that and, and we would see something like that. We would see a command or a call to do something like that as an impossibility. I can't do that. I won't do that. There's no way. And this is how most people view evangelism. You're asking me to do something that I'm not equipped to do. I can't do what you're asking. The reason that's the case, the reason most people feel that way is because like the sermon that I just told you, I would want you to trot out. We feel unqualified for it. So how about it? Is evangelism some kind of sales pitch that you have to learn how to make? Are you selling something? Is this some kind of pyramid scheme that you're expected to trot out in front of people? Are you expected to master a product that maybe you just kind of barely use? but then you're expected to try to make other people think it's the most important thing in your life? Is that the way you view evangelism? Viewing it that way means that most people see this call to Christian evangelism as asking them to be something they are not. Why don't you put on your best acting face and pretend to be an apostle for a few minutes, and then maybe you can convince somebody that Jesus is actually important to you. But that's not the call. This is not what Jesus asked you to do. What if instead, what if instead of asking you to preach a sermon next week, what if you got an actual phone call from Jesus? Hey, Jesus of Nazareth, your Lord and Savior. Hey, I'm going to need you to do something for me. Okay. You're the Lord. You tell me what to do. I'm going to need you to go to wine ins. Got an appointment for you. I just want you to meet with somebody. Okay, Jesus, what's the angle? No angle. I just want you to be yourself in that condition. Is that a little less intimidating to you? Because Jesus has just asked you to be who you are. It's not putting on a face. It's just being a person in the midst of a journey with the Lord Jesus Christ, being willing to talk about where you are and your relationship to the Lord. Not putting on a face, just being who you are. So let me ask you a question, and this is a very important question for you to ask yourself, not just today, but throughout the rest of your life. Do you, personally, do you have to pretend to be somebody you're not in order to communicate what a relationship with the God of this universe looks like? Say it again. Do you have to pretend to be someone else or something else in order to communicate with another, to another person what a relationship with the God of this universe looks like? And if you do, what is that saying about you? Sincerely conveying the truth of who you are is what Jesus has asked of you. But who are you? If you're a genuine Christ follower, there's no pretense, there's no sales pitch to be made. You can actually just talk about your genuine experiences with the God of this universe, and that should be your message that comes across. You're, you can tell your story because you're not making it up. You're not contriving facts about who you are. You can speak freely about what you're learning. You can speak freely about what you know, and you can even speak freely about what you do not yet know, and it's okay. Jesus did not ask you to lie. Jesus did not ask you to pretend to be someone else. What I'm telling you is this. Take a cue from the woman at the well. You remember Jesus meets a woman at the well, and he has a brief interchange with her. And she has only known Jesus for a matter of minutes, at the most maybe an hour, and she's in the middle of the city doing what? She's testifying about him. She's evangelizing. She's going, come and see this man. Could this be the Messiah? Now, how much does she know? Does she know everything about Jesus? No, she's heard very little, but she's just telling her story and where she is in the midst of her story. This guy has something. Come see with me. Come hear whether or not, if this could be the Messiah. Now, this should be tremendously freeing for every person in this room because Jesus has asked you to be who? yourself. Be who you are. But it's a certain kind of self, a self that is evidently belonging to Christ, a disciple of his, consistently. 
Your relationship with God needs to be evident to outsiders. Uh, a couple years ago, we had a, a pastor come speak to us and do a little conference for our congregation, Tim Wallingford. And uh, Tim, while he was here, described this function as planting the flag. He said it simply this way. He said, God needs you to be the person who shows up in your office or your workplace or your school and kind of brings forth a banner, not literally, but like in a spiritual sense, goes, hey, this is who I am. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of his. It just makes it evident to everybody who's around you. This is who I am. I serve God. I know God. I pursue God. He's the core of my life. If you know who Jesus is, and you know who you are in Christ, then at some point, you've got to make it evident that that relationship exists. I am who I am. It's all that I am. Take a cue from Popeye. We're going to start our passage in the Beatitudes. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Jesus is going to describe a type of person. And this is, this is what we want to start with. We're not going to have time to exhaustively roll through this today. I've done a whole sermon on this, I think, uh, just like two years ago. You can find it online if you're looking for it. But let's begin looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Jesus is saying, here's a certain kind of person. Blessed is, or blessed is this person. This person's in the right place. The term can also mean happy. Happy is this person or content, or well-founded, or good is such a person. Listen to Jesus' words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, what's Jesus saying? He's not saying, hey, look at all these individual people. He's like, there's a certain kind of person that occupies these categories. This is the person I want you to think about and look like. Well, what's this person like? They're poor in spirit, which means they're humble. The person of humility. They are those who mourn. What does he mean by that? Have you ever met a person who's flippant about everything? They're never serious about anything. Jesus is saying, don't be that. Don't be the, type, be the type of individual who can be serious and have a little gravitas and be intense about some things and recognize life and death and everything after and let that be seen in who you are. Be humble. Be those who mourn. Be gentle. Now, you might remember gentleness or meekness. I told you, remember an animal. Whenever you think of gentle or meek, remember an animal. What's the animal? Warhorse. Warhorse. A war horse is gentle. War horses kick in people's chest and bite their faces off, right? How is a war horse meek or gentle? The term gentle as it was used in the New Testament context means power under control or power under authority. Jesus is saying, be seen to be that. Don't be weak, be powerful, but be power under control. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Desire to be right before God. Be merciful. That means have pity. Be compassionate on other people. Be pure of heart. May your will, may your driving goal be to be good and be a peacemaker. Don't escalate things. Be a balm. Be a salve. Don't be caustic. Okay, that kind of person. Get a sense of who that person is, right? Have you met people like that? When you meet people like that, aren't you just like, oh, this is good. This is nice. This is really nice. You might be like that. How do people in the world think about such people? How do those who are outside of Christ feel about them? Are they like, man, that person's great. Love being around. Sometimes they are. But let's look at the next verse. Verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When you're this kind of person, some people are going to look at you and be like, that's nice. There are going to be a lot of other people who look at you and think, I hate this person. You, this person is the stink of death to me. Jesus said, expect it. And he said, they will hate you because of who? Because of him. 
In other words, it's not just you they're hating, but they're looking past you to the one who is inside of you, and they despise him. Okay, so what's Jesus saying at the front end of this? He's saying there is a certain kind of person, and he's describing the person. This is a person blessed of God. This is the person who is best in this life and most happy in this life. And so what are we saying at the outset? Jesus is calling you to be this kind of person. Let this be who you are. If you don't match up to this, by the way, let this be who you are. Be it consistently, be it publicly, and in doing so, who's going to be revealed through you? Jesus is the easy Sunday school answer. Okay, now let's get specific. Let's talk about the salt principle. It's in the very next verse as we begin in verse 13. Have you ever mistaken sugar for salt or salt for sugar? Ever made that mistake? Sometimes we do it in a recipe. Sometimes you might do that in a cup of coffee. You know, if you're one of those people who adulterates your coffee with extra additives. Just drink it black. What the Lord wanted. Uh, we had friends over one time, and one of the guys who was over, uh, I guess, liked a lot of sugar in his coffee. And I'm not sure why we had salt sitting out in what looked like a sugar shaker or something there, but we did. And so he, I, I guess, used a lot of what he thought was sugar in his coffee. And then he came outside onto the, the deck behind my house, and he just knocked back a big gulp of it. it. Had cream and all that other stuff in it, right? So it was cool enough. And so he throws it back. And then, have you ever come up out of the ocean with like a lung full of salt water? That's the noise he made. Just like, Wah! you know, <laughs> horrendous. Salt makes a difference, doesn't it? Man, salt gets into something. You can tell that it's there. It's, you can tell it's there when it's in the right amount. You can tell when it's there if it's in the wrong amount. And so it is with salt of the earth people. We are those people. Let's look at this passage. A, pa- a passage I think many of us are familiar with but you might not know the full story of it. I would think most Christians probably don't know the full story on this passage. Let's take a look at it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, when you think of salt, what do you think of? Table salt, probably, right? Seasoning salt, maybe cleaning off sidewalks. I don't think Jesus had that in mind for like snow removal. Uh, But generally you think table salt. Table salt, it's it's what we use to flavor our foods. And this is a correct interpretation of this scripture. Jesus definitely had the seasoning of meat or the seasoning of food in mind when he spoke about this. And here's the the, uh, attribution of this to the Christian life. In a world full of anxiety and fear and animosity, We should be salt. We should exude a certain flavor. We should exude joy and confidence. We should be different than the world in this regard. While flavoring foods is certainly a way that Jesus took this text on some level and applied this text, if that's all you think about when you hear this text, you're missing out on a whole lot of other uses with regard to salt. So let's talk about what else salt was. In most prior generations and time periods before refrigeration, What did people primarily think of the use of salt for? Preserving, right? You've got to use salt on meat. And so the idea was this. You would take a piece of meat, and if you wanted to be able to enjoy that for more than a day or so, you know, before that horse meat turns bad, you've got to salt it. Hopefully not horse meat, right? And so you cover it in salt. And when you cover it in salt, you're doing two things. First of all, you're going to help the meat to dry out. But more importantly, that salt is caustic to bacteria which means that wherever corruption tries to form on that which was intended for nutrition, it's destroying the corruption before it can set in to what was meant for good. Think about that as it applies to the life of a Christian. Not just that you're flavoring life that's out there, you are preserving that which was intended for nutrition, and you're staving off corruption. Here you cannot find purchase on meat that has been thoroughly salted. Okay, but what about before even that? What about if we go all the way back to the first century and listen to a first century audience? How would somebody in Jesus' day and age hear this discussion of salt? The book of Matthew was written for a Jewish audience, which means it was almost assumed that anybody reading Matthew, at least at the time it was written, was Jewish and from Israel proper, and which, which means that they probably understood exactly what Jesus was talking about when he discussed salt. 
But the book of Luke was written for non-Jews, and thank the Lord that it was, because sometimes it conveys something in the book of Luke for us that maybe was taken for granted by the book of Matthew. If you've got your Bibles open to Matthew 5 still, just jot in the margin, Luke chapter 14, verse 34 and 35. Jesus is going to recount the same teaching, but he's going to add a little something to, us, to it that helps us understand more of what was meant by salt usage. Luke 14, verse 34 and 35. Therefore, says Luke, or says Jesus, I'm sorry. Therefore, salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, with what shall it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Salt, for everyone in Jesus' prime target audience, was a product of the Dead Sea. Everybody in Israel during this time period got their salts from the Dead Sea. It was where it was mined and harvested. The Dead Sea shores were a, a prime location for mineral deposits that were rife with a variety of mineral salts. And while some of those salts were used for flavoring and preservatives, that was actually not the primary use of Dead Sea salt. Let's talk about the manure pile. Now, when you hear this, you probably think, if you're, if you're like a, an American living in this time period, when you hear that salt's not even useful for the manure pile, you're probably like, man, that's got to be like the worst, like worse than useless. It's not even good for the pile of dung. Like that's how bad it is. We can't find a bad enough place to throw this out. But that's not what was intended here. Uh, if you've used the bathrooms here in the church, you probably recognize that behind the toilet, I hope you've recognized this, we keep Febreze back there, right? And the idea is we don't want your corruption to seep out into the rest of the church, right? In this era, if we can just be a little blunt with what was going on, we need to talk about um, how people did their business back in this day and age. And if there's one thing we've learned from children's books, it's that everybody poops, Right? And so in this era, if you were part of Jesus' prime audience, when you had to go to the bathroom, you would go out behind your domicile and you usually had an area sort of designated as your manure pile. And you would squat down out there and you would do your business. But they almost always kept a box right next to where that was. And in the box were salts. And so you would scoop up a handful of those Dead Sea salts and you would dump the salts on your dump, right? And the idea was this, it was doing a number of things. First of all, it was drying that out and it was halting the corruption and it was inhibiting the smell. Okay, now I want you to think about this. Those salts taking the worst situation and making it so that, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but if you're familiar with germ theory, a lot of plague originates from feces open to open air. It's just left out in the open. And so even though these people did not have a modern version of germ theory, they still were operating according to modern germ theory on some level. And this actually kept, keeps things like plague at bay. Isn't that interesting? And so what does the salt do? The salt has to try to be salt really hard. No, it doesn't. The salt is just salt. And it goes in on the manure pile. And what does it do? Well, it keeps some of the worst experiences from coming forth and destroying whole cultures. But this is not all that it was for. Did you notice he said it's not even good for the soil? Not even good for the soil? I thought salt was bad for soil. Well, generally it is, but you're thinking of sodium chloride, table salt. That's not the only salt there is. There's also potassium chloride. You ever heard of potassium chloride? Maybe you know it by its, its other farming or botanical name, potash. Potash is one of the main components of the world's best fertilizers. In fact, to this day, Dead sea salts are mined in, on, on the shores of the Dead Sea. The potassium chloride is mined for some of the best fertilizers in the world. This day, they still distribute it from, dead sea, from the Dead Sea shores. So what's it used for? You put that in your fields so that you get an amazing harvest. Because good salt, by just being what it is, put into the soil, causes growth. Okay. So quick synopsis. What is salt? Salt is flavoring. Salt brings flavor. It brings zest and zeal. Salt is a preservative. It preserves that which is nutrient and good. Salt destroys corruption. Salt is, is also something that fertilizes and can produce good growth. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus' idea is that you would get out there 
by being something you're not. No, by being who you are and change a whole culture. But then there's this other category here, saltless salt. Saltless salt? You guys ever seen uh, Monty Python and Search for the Holy Grail? Yes, classic work of English literature. If you've seen the movie, uh, you'll remember this scene. If not, I'll just briefly describe it to you. Um, Plague-ridden Europe. You've got a, a cart of dead bodies in the plague situation, and they're, they're rolling through town, and they're saying, bring out your dead. Ding. Bring out your dead. Ding. And the idea was, every, if you have a corpse in your house, you bring it out, you throw it onto the cart, you pay them a little money, and, they, and this, this is what they did in actually like plague-infused Europe. And the, the comedy comes into play when a, a man brings out the dead and he's like, here's your money. And he goes to put the, the body on the cart, but then you hear, I'm not quite dead. <laughs> right? I'm not quite dead. And the guy's like, quiet you, you'll be stone dead in a moment. Right? And he's trying to get this, uh, apparently like an infirmed relative that he just wanted to get rid of. He's trying to get him onto the death cart so they'll haul him off. Right? And so the, the comedy interchange occurs around when death occurs. Look, you are either dead or you're not dead. Despite what Princess Bride told you, there's no midpoint. We're calling out heresy where we see it. All right. You're either dead or you're not dead. They're, they're, categorically, you're one of the two things. You can't be both at the same time. And the same is true of many things in this life, right? If I ask you what the, what the wife's name is of a married bachelor, you'd probably say, what? Married bachelor? Married bachelor? No. If you're a bachelor, you're not married. That's what it means to be a bachelor, right? If I ask you, please, here's a piece of paper. Please draw me a square circle. And it's got to be one of the two. It's either a square or it's a circle. If you, if you go between the two, you have neither. And if you convert one to the other, then you don't have the original, right? And so what we see in this text is this saltless salt or tasteless salt. I was in a men's group uh, earlier this year. We were at, talking through this passage during the summer. And uh, Keith Kerman, one of the guys in the group, says, okay, so how can salt be not salty? I don't understand this. When he asked that question, he was asking a very good question. Theologians throughout the ages have asked this. What is saltless salt? What does that even mean? What is tasteless? How does salt become tasteless? That makes no sense. I suspect the first century um, audience found this just as jarring and weird as you and, I are, as you and I do. Salt is salt. That makes no sense. You're either salt or you're not salt, right? The only way for salt to stop being salt is if it loses its fundamental essence, if it ceases to be what it is. Maybe we could say this this way. If a disciple is not really a disciple, that's saltless salt. If somebody presents themselves as a follower of Jesus Christ, and yet they are not a follower of Jesus Christ on any level, that is saltless salt. We might call them Christian posers. We're not talking about people who struggle to do the right things and who fail and have to keep getting back up. We're not talking about that. We're talking about somebody who claims the name of Jesus Christ, but does not believe it and does not live it at all. Saltless salt. What's Jesus' prescription for such people? In the first century, apparently, it was a great scam to sell salt, and you sell a package of salt that contains a little bit of salt, but also contains sand. It was a good scam. You only get away with it a few times, and then people want to kill you. Uh, how would, you would it make any difference to you whether or not you had salt on the table or sand? Which do you want going into the soup? Uh, when I was uh, about four years old or so, um, my older brother, Adam, did something that older brothers sometimes do to the younger brothers. We were in the sandbox. And he said to me, Benji, eating sand makes you strong. And I was a skeptic. But then he lifted up one of our big Tonka trucks, a metal truck out there, and he picked it up to show me. See, it's, it's kind of hard to lift this. But then he pretended to eat sand. He's like, now look at this. Poop, and he just whipped it. And I was like, whoa, science. <laughs> and so I took a big spoonful of sand, and I put it in my mouth, and I began to chew. One star, do not recommend. Uh, I ran into the house crying. I believe that Adam got a swat for that. If not, he's over there. <laughs> Take care of him today. 
Um, I'll, I'll tell you, eating sand and thinking, thinking it's something it's not is not a pleasant experience. It would matter to you. It would matter very much if you had the real deal or something that was fake and passed off as the real deal. There are few insults more profound than calling someone a good for nothing. Have you ever thought about that? You're good for nothing. You have zero net value, a complete waste. This is Jesus' assessment of somebody who is not really salt, but claiming to be. Saltless salt is utterly worthless. To put this in terms for today, are you who you claim to be? Are you calling yourself a Christian, or do you identify as salt while you are merely sand? If you were to purchase salt, and it cannot be used for flavor, and it cannot be used to destroy corruption, and it cannot be used as fertilizer, then it is worthless. It is to be tossed out and trampled. Did you see what he said? Trampled by who? Trampled by men. In other words, the judgment for you is not even necessarily a divine judgment, but you were to be exiled, and somebody is coming after you that is not necessarily even a part of God's kingdom. I don't know if you notice this or not, but people outside of Christ love finding hypocrites. They love it when they can look at the church and be like, see, I told you, that's what they're all like. You see what that person is? That's the reason I don't follow Jesus Christ. And of course, they'll trample them. But to some degree, the church should be trampling such a person. What are we told about the person who is living outside of the kingdom of God while within the body of believers and will not accept rebuke and will not turn their life around? We're told to exile that person, kick that person to the curb. So they're not finding solace with the church and they're not finding solace out there. So what does salt do? Very quickly, recap. Salt brings zest and flavor. You are meant to be flavor, joy, and wonderment and intrigue in this world. Salt destroys corruption. Your life is to have a, a, an influence that destroys corruption out there by just being who you are out there. You are meant to be a fertilizer of sorts. You are meant to bring forth life for the kingdom of God by just being who you are out there. Okay, everybody understand the salt principle? Let's talk about the light principle. You guys know that we uh, put all of our sermons online, right? Some of you found us that way. Many of you like decided, yeah, I'm not going to go there until we make sure this isn't a cult. And so you watched the sermons online to be like, let's see if it's crazy or not. And you came anyway. Can you imagine if every week we put our sermons up online, but we set them to private so that only the uploader could view them? Why bother? Why do that? Or imagine this, you might know that the county knocked down our sign out in front and we got to put a new sign out there. So let's imagine when it comes time to put a new sign out front, we decide we're going to put a sign, but we're going to put it in, in a hedge so that it can only be viewed if you walk into the hedge. Can't be viewed from the road, can't be even viewed from the parking lot. Why would we do that? Why bother? Do you guys have attics? Do you decorate your attics for company? Do you decorate your crawl space? By the way, if you do, Quit it. That is weird. <laughs> this is the comparison that Christ is making of the life of disciples. Let's continue on with Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. Who's the light of the world? We are. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. If you're biblically literate, you might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought Jesus was the light of the world. And the answer is, yeah, he is. All right, so if you've got your Bibles and you're still open to Matthew 5, in the margin, write John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus said this. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So who's the light of the world? Is it Jesus or is it his followers? Both, yes. Who is in Jesus' followers? Jesus, which means if people are looking at you, they should be seeing the light of Christ coming through you in the way you live. Amen? Amen. What is light? What does light do? Light is a means of direction. It's a, it's a means of navigation. It is a warning of peril. It is direction to get you to a particular place. As Jesus said, he who follows me will not walk in darkness. An old friend of mine tells a story of a hunting trip he took to Alaska. There's a group of three guys, and they, they took a plane to Alaska. Then they took a smaller plane out to like a, 
you know, a water territory. They got off the plane in the water and then they went on the land and then they hiked to the base of a mountain and they were going to go hunting up on the side of the mountain. Well, after they had gone all that way, one of the three guys was like, dude, I am done walking today. I'm staying in base camp. And the other guys were like, we got a lot of daylight left. Let's go up and hunt. And so two of the three guys went up on the mountainside to go hunting. One of the guys stayed back in camp. Well, they told him, you know, they'd be back in camp before nightfall. And so he was waiting. He had kind of the fire ready and, and things were kind of set in the camp. But he was just kind of relaxed and took a nap for a little while. Woke up and it was twilight. and His friends weren't back yet. And twilight turned into full dark. And his friends still weren't back yet. And about an hour went by in the darkness when he was really starting to worry. Did they fall off a precipice? Did they fall into a ravine? Right? Did, did a rock fall on them? Were they attacked by a grizzly bear? Like, what, what happened to my friends? And then he realized, it's really cold out right now, and I don't think they took much in the way of, like, attire. And I'm not sure they actually even took any flashlights. So he takes a flashlight out, and he goes and he stands in the middle of the camp, and then he just starts, it turns on the flashlight, and he just starts kind of moving it side to side across the mountain. Nothing. Waits about 10 minutes. He's like, I'll do it again. He goes back out, turns the light back on, and just kind of pans it across the mountain. And he hears a voice from a great distance away. Keep the light on! Okay. He moves the light back and forth for a little bit. He turns it off to conserve batteries. Turn the light back on! He's panning the light back and forth. And it was more than an hour when his friends were able to get back into camp of just doing this over and over again and trying to guide them in. Turn the light back on. This is who we are. You are the light of the world. There are people lost in the darkness. When his friends finally got back to camp, they said it, it was getting dark way faster than we thought it was going to. We thought we had plenty of time to get down. And by the time it had gone full dark, like we were using our cell phones trying to see and could not discern where we were going. And we realized it was getting very dangerous. We had no idea where we were. We thought for sure we we're going to freeze to death on the mountain that night. Well, they saw light. There are people that you know who are in despair and desperately need to see where the answer is in this life. You are the light of this world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. You know what Jesus is saying when he says that, when he compares us to a city on a hill? You imagine in the ancient world what it was like to travel and be walking on roads where you were in danger of bandits and then afar off you see, oh, there it is shelter. There is the place of refuge and safety and security and civilization in this world. Jesus says you are meant to be that. People should see you out there and be like, look, shelter. Look, refuge. Light is a means of direction. Light is also a source of clarity. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night and seen someone standing in the corner of your room and you jump up ready to fight only to discover that you were about to lay the smack down on a, on a boat hanging on a closet door or on a blanket that was folded over a chair. Ever had that? Jump up with killing intent and you're like, I was about to kill a blanket. The, the world is punching at shadows. There are people who have no idea what the biggest problems in this world are. No, don't begin to know what the greatest solutions that have been provided are. We are to be that light that's out there. We're to be the light that flips on that goes, man, you've been fighting the wrong thing. Look, here's clarity. Here's understanding. This is what Jesus has called us to be. He has set forth his body on earth to be an open invitation to make sense out of all of this. And look, if you've looked around the world very long, man, this does not make a lot of sense apart from Jesus Christ and what he's called us to, does it? This is a suicidal culture. This culture is in shambles. We need Christ. All right, let's talk concentrations and dispersions. Salt does not do what, salt does not have to try to be salt, just is. And when salt is put in a place, it does what salt is supposed to do. Light does not have to constantly try to be light. It just is light. And when you put it in certain environments, it accomplishes certain feats. And such are you. So am I. There's a big difference between a little salt in the soup and a little soup in the salt. Which do you want to put in your mouth? <laughs> 
A little salt in the right proportion can make all the difference in food, but if you've ever, I don't know, taken the lid off of a salt shaker and just jammed your tongue in there, you probably went, this isn't the way this is supposed to be. The same thing is true of using salt to keep down corruption or of putting fertilizer in a field. Salt must be disseminated to be effective. And the same is true of light. Did you have an electrician come to your house and say, you know what, just put all the lights in the bathroom? Floor, wall, ceiling, let's just cover the whole bathroom with lights. I mean, same number of lights in the house. Does it matter whether they're spread out in the home or would you rather just have they be consolidated? Do any of you operate your home that way? No, chances are you go, in order for these lights to be effective, we've got to put them where there's darkness or potential darkness. Makes sense, right? So it is true of the world. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The goal was not to gather all the salt and the light into one place, but for all of us to be disseminated out there. Amen? Pastor David Paulson tells a story of a woman from his church who came up to him. She had a praise she wanted to share with him. She was just beaming and excited, and so he was excited for her, and he was smiling at her. And she explained to him, she's like, I just, I, great, great news this week. I was working in a firm where I was the only Christian who was there, and it was disheartening, it was discouraging, and it was very difficult. But a Christian business just had an opening, and I applied for the position, and I got in. It is all Christians in this environment. They open every day with prayer. You're given time to do Bible studies together during the day, and it sounds amazing. But as she's talking about it, she can see his face has moved from joy for her to just getting more and more disconcerted. And eventually he's frowning, looks sad. She's like, what, what did I say? What's wrong? And he said, you just told me that you were the only connection these people had to the light. And now you're leaving them in darkness. Now, most of us don't think that way. Most of us are like, I just want to be around Christians. And what a wonderful thing it is to be around Christians. But listen, we're meant to be out there. Light has to go to someplace dark in order to make a difference. Amen? So here's the practical implementation and the challenge that we want to put before you this week. We don't want to be salt that is all bottled up all the time. We've got to get out there and change the flavor of things, stop corruption, and make things grow. We don't want to be a city's worth of lights sitting around in this room. You might be saying to yourself, Ben, didn't last week you just say the church should be like our prime location for fellowship and community? Amen, I did, but not so that we can stay here and only be around one another so that we could recharge and empower and go out there and make a difference. Practical implementation. Establish who you are this week. Plant a flag. Here's what I want you to do. This week, pray out there. Pray out there. If you're in the lunchroom, bow your head. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Let it be seen. You're not doing this for a show. You're doing this because you care about God, and you're the same person out there Monday that you are in here on Sunday. Talk to God. If some, one of your coworkers comes to you and they're talking about a situation in their life that is difficult and hard to contend with, instead of just being like, oh man, I feel for you so much, say to that person, can I pray for you? I want to take this before the throne of the living God. Or maybe even better, say, can I pray for you right now? But that would be weird. It's only weird because you're never doing it. It's only weird because you're treating God like a concept and not like a reality. Reality. One of the things we do on the regular, um, if you've been out to eat with me, you've probably seen me do this before, but if you're out at a restaurant, waitress or waiter comes over and introduces themselves, remember their name, and before you eat, say, hey, we're going to pray in just a minute. Is there anything we can pray for you for? Just a simple connection. Just a little bit of salt out there. Just a little bit of light flicked on somewhere out in the darkness. Pray out there. Secondly, talk openly about church and about God. Spouses, how would you feel about your wife or your husband if you knew that every time they were out in the world apart from you, they worked very hard to make sure that nobody knew they were married? Would you be concerned? Would you maybe be just a little bit upset at them? Maybe concerned about fidelity. How do you think the God of this universe feels when we try to keep his relationship with us secret out there? It, we go to great lengths to not say God or to not say church. Can I encourage you? Be free 
and be easy. Be the same person you are on Monday that you are on Sunday. Talk about your relationship with God. Talk about how you're making choices in this world. Talk about the spiritual dynamics. Talk about deep things. Ask deep questions. Be that person out there. Amen? Plant a flag for the kingdom of God. Whoever else rules over you in the office or in the school or in the factory or in the shop, the Lord Jesus Christ should be seen to be the prime ruler of you each and every day. Don't be obnoxious with it. There's no reason to make this any more weird than it has to be. Um, don't try to drag that into every single conversation or circumstance, but where it is natural, talk about the kingdom of God. Amen? Okay, objections. Some of you right now are going, that's great advice, Ben, for that person down the road. But for me, it doesn't work. You know why? Because I might have to have a meeting with HR if I say something like that. You concerned about a meeting with HR? Have a meeting with HR. Good. Go talk to HR. Talk to them about your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a captive audience. They have to listen to you. For the time being, we have First Amendment freedoms in this country. Um, and that might not last too long, right? But for right now, you are allowed freedom of religious expression. Now, you, don't, you can't rep represent your company necessarily as being a Christian company, but you are allowed to be a Christian no matter where you are in this culture right now. You with me? And if somebody tells you you can't, we've got a couple lawyers in the congregation, probably like to talk to you. But Ben, I would look like a hypocrite. How about you let that fear encourage you to not be a hypocrite? Live consistently with your, your, your calling by the Lord Jesus Christ. Be a disciple out there. But listen, there are going to be moments in your work and in your career where you do look like a hypocrite because you did something or said something you shouldn't. And at that moment, that is the time for you to show that you are a true Christian by saying, I need to beg your forgiveness because I should not have talked that way. I was wrong in doing that. That was sinful of me. And I want to apologize to you. And I, I would like for you to forgive me, please. And then explain to people or allow it to be seen that a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a perfect person. They are a sinner who has a savior. But Ben, people will think I'm weird. You are weird. We all agree. You're weird. Look, friends, um, light is going to seem really strange to the darkness. And there's no way around that. Salt is going to taste really weird if all you've been eating is, is like oatmeal with no flavoring. Right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to change things. The only way for you to change things is to be different from the world you are in. Amen? But Ben, some people will reject me. Yeah, they will. Jesus said as much. He said people will reject you. But remember, when they're rejecting you, who are they actually rejecting? The Lord Jesus Christ. That might not be permanent. Sometimes people come back around, but even if it is permanent, your hands will be clean when you come into eternity because you've done what he asked you to do. In conclusion, stop hiding. Stop hiding the light within you. Stop hiding the truth you know. Stop hiding from those who are perishing. You are not doing them any favors by keeping Jesus Christ from being spoken about in front of them. In fact, you might be actively keeping many people from coming to know God. You might be keeping many people from coming to make it safely back to the place which they need to be. Go out, prevent and slow down the corruption of this life. Be flavor and zest. Go out and make something grow for the kingdom of this God. Be light that invites people back into community. Be that each and every day. Be the same person you are on Monday that you are on Sunday. I want to end today the way I heard Pastor Derek Prince conclude the sermon uh, that he preached on this topic. I love this. We're all going to stand up together. And we're going to read the passage again, but we're changing the pronouns so that we're talking not about you, but about we and our. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. Ready? We are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can we be made salty again? We are no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. We are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And we give light to all who are in the house. Let our light shine before men in such a way that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God. 
Thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for just calling us to be who we are in the world. Father, I pray that we would pay attention to that. Lord, that we would not hide the light that you've set within us. That we would just seek to be salt out there in this world, changing things by just being who we are in the world. Father, as we go forth today, help us to be bold. Help us to plant a flag this week and help us to stick to it and be the people you've called us to be. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.